A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain, Discussion with a Hermit on the Jesus Prayer, written by Metropolitan of Nafpaktos, Hirothius, translated by Effie Mavra Makali, published by Birth of the Theotokos Monastery, Lavadia, Greece. Forward for the New Revised Edition. A Night in the Desert of the Holy Mountain is a book which brings to light the quintessence of Orthodox spiritual life the Jesus prayer or prayer of the heart, and how it can be practiced by monks, nuns, and lay people. The discussion flows in a spontaneous and immediate way, with the dialogue form of the book contributing to this. The reader enjoys the simple presentation of the teachings of the Church on the Jesus prayer, through the authentic experience of an Athenite hermit, and when a hermit's mouth opens, it fills you with fragrance. The Holy Mountain is a blessed place for the entire church. There are monks there who practice the Jesus prayer without ceasing and who struggle to live the ascetic life, which is actually life according to the gospel. Thus they become bearers of the holy tradition of the church. It is with such a monk and ascetic that the author of this book enters into dialogue. The book has been a classic of its kind in Greece, where it is now in its twentieth edition in Greek. It has also been translated into French, Arabic, Spanish, Russian, Hungarian, Serbian, Romanian, Chinese, Ukrainian, and Bulgarian. The translation into English was undertaken as a response to the request of many English-speaking friends who believe that the text has a lot to offer to all our brethren in Christ who thirst and seek for intimate communion with God, for the transformation and unification of their inner world, through the energy of the grace of God, and who desire to become dwelling places of the Most Holy Spirit. The author of this book is himself an admirer of the niptic tradition of the Church, which he also presents in his other books. His series of four books on Orthodox psychotherapy, The Science of the Fathers, is of great interest since he believes that the niptic tradition of the Church has a therapeutic value. Metropolitan Hirothius of Nafaktos believes that Christianity is not a philosophy or an ideology, but rather it is a therapeutic science and a therapeutic treatment which cures the innermost aspect of one's personality. It is within this framework that the present book operates. I am indebted to Sister Pelagia of Birth of the Theotokos Monastery, who kindly offered to revise the translation and made several necessary corrections. This is a valuable contribution, particularly as the English translation has opened the way for many other translations in various languages, and this, I think, is a great offering to the Orthodox world outside Greece. Effie Mavromakali Preface It is by inspiration of divine love that in our day there is a reawakening of the desire for mystical theology and the teaching of the Fathers for asceticism, watchfulness, and unceasing noetic prayer of the heart. How is it that in the high tide of man-centered, materialistic, and this-worldly understanding, there emerge souls desiring the true life in Christ, seeking perfection, union with God, who want to live according to the tradition of our Church and the Holy Fathers? This change is by the right hand of the Most High. This is the work of the Holy Spirit, who lives eternally and who sets apart and makes holy the souls in the body of Christ, our holy Orthodox, Catholic, and Apostolic Church. After many ordeals, it is becoming increasingly clear today that the tradition of the Holy Fathers is not a luxury, but a prerequisite for a truly genuine Orthodox way of life. And it is a great blessing that the most merciful Lord planted in the midst of the church the paradise of the garden of the Theotokos, the holy mountain, to revive the church through the gift of the grace of God, which comes down to us today through the living tradition of the Holy Fathers uninterruptedly. The author of this present book yearns for this tradition. He lives and works in the world, but his abiding city is in heaven, the heaven of the holy mountain, which is the foretaste of the kingdom to come. The Lord who loves mankind and who gives what our soul truly desires has given to our commander Hirothius Vlachos the grace to love the spiritual atmosphere of the holy mountain and to hear within himself his own mystical heartbeat of the prayerful words 
Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. He has spoken with the Holy Fathers and has received their blessings. He has heard words spoken of eternal life, and out of the fullness of his heart he offers these conversations to his brethren. It is a sign of the love of the Holy Fathers for us, that while they reveal to us the heights of the spiritual life, encouraging us not to be faint-hearted in our spiritual efforts, they also show us at the same time the first steps which we, our inexperienced, must take. They show us the heights, but they take us by the hand in order for us to take the first steps. Thus, this present work not only presents noetic prayer in its perfected state, but also introduces it in its initial stages for our brothers and sisters in the world to practice so that they can be strengthened and made holy. I believe that through the blessing of Our Lady, the Theotokos, who already in the Holy of Holies lived the fullness of mystical ascent and communion with the Triune God, this book will prove beneficial to the writer and the readers. It goes without saying that the more frequent, frequently people read books about the prayer of Jesus, the greater will their desire be to practice it. To our God, from whom we receive every good and every perfect gift, be glory throughout all the ages. Amen. Signed, Archimandrite George, abbot of the Monastery of Grigoriu on the Holy Mountain. Introduction In the following pages I present a discussion which I had with a Yerondos on the Holy Mountain. I did not intend to record it. One day, however, just as I was getting ready to read one of the works of St. Maximus, I heard an inner voice urging me to write down the discussion I had with the wise Athenite monk, and I obeyed that voice, which I confess I had not heard before. I started writing as it came to my mind. That is why what follows is the output of only a few hours' work, and I apologize to the reader for this. First of all, though, I would like to make a few comments. Firstly, the book should not be read as a story, but rather as a teaching sent by God to that wise Athenite who was a God by grace. The reader should stop at times to think, but much more, however, to pray. He might need to read over the discussion twice. Secondly, the dialogue should be read keeping in mind the purpose for which it was written, that is, the practice of the prayerful life. We should at once make the decision to enter into the divine darkness of the Jesus prayer, which is Mount Sinai and Mount Tabor, where we will meet God. The invocation of the name of Jesus is accompanied by his immediate revelation because the name evokes a form of his presence, Evdokimov. This thought is in accordance with the words of the Lord, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, Matthew 18.20, as well as with the apostolic word, Therefore I want you to understand that no one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. When someone is praying the Jesus prayer, the Holy Spirit descends like the cloud on Mount Tabor. Thirdly, the reader should not try to find out who the monk is I spoke with. He may not be successful, and his judgments may be wrong. That holy Yenandus would not approve. Fourthly, the reader may be impressed by the number of patristic quotes. It must be emphasized, however, that the monks who strive on Manathos have a spiritual affinity with the Holy Fathers of our Church. The Holy Spirit, who lived and acted within the Holy Fathers, also lives and acts in them. They have, in other words, the Spirit of the Fathers, and so can be ever mindful of their teachings without much labor and special effort. Apart from that, many times during the discussion, the wise hermit, who has seen God, opened his books, St. Gregory Palamas, St. Simeon the New Theologian, the Philokalia, etc., which he kept near him and read and commented on many passages. My ardent wish is that there be readers who are helped to experience the Jesus prayer, which has sanctified so many others, and that they too may be made holy. I feel obliged to turn my thoughts also to the heroic and respected men, the images of divine love who live on Manathos, who abandon the world and live the real world, not the deformed world, but the transfigured world, who experience the living God. They are the contemporary witnesses of Christ, who have separated themselves from this world and who are in fact dead, so far as the world is concerned. 
These holy men have often supported and helped me, have fed me with their own bread, and I who am poor owe them so much. I am poor, but if I had not taken even this little food, I would have died. I am hungry, yet I live through their grace, their blessings, and their love. The following lines are thus dedicated to those fathers who have made the holy mountain heaven in gratitude for their great love, in return for their love. To those who have passionately loved the threefold poverty, material poverty, spiritual poverty, that is humility and obedience, and that of the body, chastity. To those fathers who have truly lived the beatitudes of the Lord, for by becoming poor in spirit they became rich, and by becoming meek they inherited the earth. They mourned and were comforted. They hungered for righteousness and were satisfied. They were merciful and they obtained mercy. Becoming pure in heart, they saw God as far as this is possible. Becoming peacemakers, they were made worthy of becoming sons of God. O holy fathers, blessed monks, hermits, we who are sinners declare you blessed as young men honoring their elders, sons, their fathers, and sinners, saints. St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, signed Archimandrite Herotheus Vlachos. Silence, speech, and the life of the monks. The Holy Mountain is a place of mystery where silence, which is eternity itself, speaks intensely, since silence is the language of the age to come. As the holy angels have a noetic power, inconceivable to us, through which they transmit divine thoughts to each other, St. Basil the Great, in the same way the earthly angels, who live on the holy mountain and compete with the heavenly and bodiless ones in life and prayer, have another power in order to transmit what they experience. And this power is that of silence, which, especially on the holy mountain, is the most eloquent of sermons, a silent exhortation. The monks there do not speak much. They live the mysteries of God in silence. They experience orthodox theology in an apophatic way. They listen to the voice of God through silence and acquire virtue. According to St. Simeon, the new theologian, quote, the silence of the lips, the closing of the eyes, and the deafness of the ears are for beginners in spiritual life the quick way to acquire virtue, end quote. The silence of the monks is edifying. In the sayings of the fathers, we read the following. The Archbishop Theophilus visited Scathis one day, where the brethren were exhorting Abba Pombo to say something edifying to the Archbishop. The former responded, If he is not edified by my silence, he will not be edified by my speech. One should go to the holy mountain with the intention of being edified through silence. For the visitor who knows how to be taught in this way, everything will speak to him. The silent figures of the monks, the caves of the hermits, the monasteries permeated with an atmosphere of compunction, nature itself, and inanimate objects as well, will tell many stories and transmit wonderful teachings. It is in this way that the holy mountain speaks in silence. Sometimes, however, they speak and then they edify because they set a good example by how they live. A good life without words edifies more than words without a good life. A good life edifies in silence, whereas words on their own cause disturbance. When words and life correspond to one another, they are together the whole of philosophy. As they live a holy life and have become instruments of the Holy Spirit, mystical trumpets, of the Holy Trinity, love, the Word, and wisdom, whatever words they utter bring great benefit. They have words to speak because their acts are abundant, and they say these words when they are asked. From the sayings of the fathers, the following request is familiar. Father, give me a word so that I may be saved. A word in the language of the desert means the authentic utterance spoken from the heart of the hermit as from the Holy Spirit, and the one who requests it receives it as the fruit of grace, without elaborating on it in his mind. This word from the spiritual father is absolutely necessary for the one who asks. The word comes from a soul which is the friend of God, wounded by the love of God, 
and is spoken in accordance with the measure of thirst of the one who asks. As the Holy Mother of God conceived the Word of God and gave birth to the God-man Theanthropos, Christ, becoming therefore the joy of all creation, in the same way do the fathers, because of their purity, conceive the Word and transmit it to those who thirst for it, becoming for them their joy. A few brothers who had laypersons with them approached Abba Felix and begged him to say a word to them, but the old man kept silent. After they had asked for a long time, he said to them, You wish to hear a word? They said, Yes, Abba. Then the old man said to them, There are no words nowadays. When the brothers used to consult the elders, and when they did what was said to them, God gave grace from above to show them how to speak. However, now, because they ask without doing that which they hear, God has withdrawn the grace of his word from the elders, and they do not find anything to say because there is no longer anyone who carries out their words. Hearing this, the brothers groaned, saying, Pray for us, Abba. Through this example, it is obvious that the word is the illumination of grace. Grace illumines pure and holy people and incarnates life into words. It is obvious also that the word is expressed according to the degree of thirst of him who asks, and that the monks know how to break even the coldest heart, and make it turn to God, even if they use a discreet reproach. So when you ask them, with simplicity, humility, and willingness to practice what they say, you will hear the illuminations of grace. They are simple, humble words, yet full of wisdom and grace, words which are filled with grace. And at this point, they imitate Christ, who is the almighty word of the Father, but also the embodiment of deep silence. He spoke yet he also kept silence. The movement of God toward man is precisely not only a revelation of the word, but also an expression of silence. The movement, therefore, of man toward God, as well as toward his fellow human being, should be distinguished by these two elements. You visit the holy mountain with the intention of being taught more, than, more through silence and less through the word. The monks of the holy mountain, the hermits, these songbirds of the desert live the true life. They are immersed in paradise. They are truly deified. They live the life of Christ in earthen vessels, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, in bodies which have been exhausted by ascetic practice and serving others. In these monks, one can see deification in action, so to speak, and not deification as taught theoretically by the inexperienced in theology. They live both faith and works, for without doubt faith without works is an illusion, and works without faith is idolatry. The grace of God, the image of Christ, are inscribed on their weather-beaten faces, as they have put aside the world and its hypocritical politeness. The chorus of the holy ascetics flees from what is contrary to nature, salvages what is according to nature, and becomes worthy of the gifts which are beyond nature. St. Nicodemus. When you look at them, you think that they are unhappy and sad, yet when their inner calmness overflows, how it inundates you. These holy ascetics are like big dams, which retain abundant still water, but when the dams break, their strength reveals itself as they flood the surrounding area. When the hermit's mouth opens, it will flood you with fragrance. The mouths of the holy monks are springs which flow honey and pure living water. You may think that their lives are of no value, but you will realize very soon that these hermits are trees reaching high into the sky, well equipped with leaves affording shade, giving you shelter and refreshing you. You regard them as dressed in rags, as unapproachable because of their lack of regard for tidiness and the ascetic practice of not washing. Yet very soon you see them as undying plants producing splendid fruit, lilies, evergreen, and always fragrant, whose fragrance satisfies you. And all this because Christ, the true life, lives in them. Their life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3 3. In every Athenite monk who follows in the footsteps of the Holy Fathers and lives according to their teachings, you can discern, if you have within you the Spirit of God, 
the coexistence of two seemingly opposite states, that of death and of life. Life springs from a daily death, and death becomes more dead from the enjoyment of life. The more death, sin, is put to death, the more the life of life of Christ is experienced, and the more life is experienced, the more death is put to death, to the point that the monk experiences within himself the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Sin is destroyed, and life comes forth. So it can be said that monks put on death and enjoy life. St. Paul writes to the Romans, quote, For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives in God. And quote Romans 6, verse 9. St. Nikitas de Thatos writes that the same happens to the saintly man who has become like Christ, since he lives the life of Christ, having become dead to the world. Quote, the one who has been raised from dead actions has been raised together with Christ. If he has been raised with Christ through knowledge of him, and Christ will never die again, the death of ignorance has no dominion over him. Thus he no longer lives for the flesh and the world, having become dead to the members of his body and to the material things of life. But Christ lives within him, for he is now under the grace of the Holy Spirit and not under the law of his flesh. That is to say, he has offered his members to God, the Father, as weapons of righteousness. End of quote. Nikitas de Thatos. In deified monks, rest and motion coexist. According to St. Maximus, they live in ever-moving rest, as well as a restful motion. They remain in Christ and move unceasingly toward the more perfect enjoyment of him, because Christ is the multidimensional pearl of great price. St. Gregory of Nyssa clarifies this point in a vivid manner. Quote, the strangest thing of all is how rest and motion can coexist simultaneously, since he who ascends in no way stands still, and he who stands does not ascend. But here the ascending is accomplished by standing still, which means that the more one remains firm and steadfast in the good, the more he advances in the way of virtue. End of quote Gregory of Nyssa. He abides in the good while continually in motion. He is constantly moving and he remains in Christ. There is incessant thirst for Christ, but at the same time divine satiation. A monk once said, Something strange is happening to me. I am hungry, yet I feel full. This is not at all strange, however, for the man of God. This is what is referred to as the perfect but still unfinished perfection of the perfect. The life of the monk becomes continually the life of the word of God, the logos, the life of Christ. The monk who strives forcefully experiences all the ages of Christ. Christ is incarnate within him, performs miracle, suffers the passion. He is resurrected and he ascends. Living, therefore, in Christ, he attains not only the unification of his whole inner world, but also of the world around him. He overcomes all the divisions, and he ascends to an even higher level than Adam's state before the fall. St. Maximus refers to the five divisions which Adam failed to overcome, whereas man succeeds in this now through the help of the new Adam, Christ. He can overcome the divisions create between created and uncreated, between that which is perceived by the noose and that perceived by the senses, heaven and earth, paradise and the universe, between man and woman. By overcoming the last division, he goes on to overcome the first, that of created and uncreated. A holy man of God brings his whole self, as well as the entire world, to God. That is why the saint is the greatest benefactor of humanity. On the holy mountain, I once approached such a Yerondas, a Yerondas who enjoys the never-ending fullness of divine mercy. Living in little more than an opening in the earth, he has overcome all the conventions of this world. There are no words to describe him. If you characterize him as wise, you fall short. If you call him mad, you do not convey the greatness of his spiritual folly. 
you do not know how to describe him. As he has escaped the categories of this world, he goes on towards the depths of eternity. He touches the divine fire, and he is literally a flame. He is on fire now with the uncreated light. At times while you are talking with him, you think that he will be ignited and be completely consumed in flames. You think that he will vanish bodily from before you like the prophet Elijah on the fiery chariot. At the very moment when he speaks to you, you think that he will ascend into heaven like the Lord who, while he blessed them, parted from them and was carried up to heaven. Luke twenty four fifty one. Yet, what you think will happen does not, because something else is happening. The compunction that is created while he is talking to you about matters of the spiritual life is similar to the wonder that took hold of the disciples on Mount Tabor. A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. Matthew 17, verses 5-6 to six. While he is speaking, the Holy Spirit descends, encompassing you, capturing you. Fear seizes you but also the desire to remain there. When the holy ascetic is speaking to you in his simple, unaffected words, you remember Christ talking to his disciples on the top of a mountain or on a boat in the sea. The holy ascetic, indeed, is talking to you from the mountain of, of Theoria, a vision of God, and from the sea of eternity, beyond mundane and trivial matters, beyond what you are. I approach this Yerundus one day. I knew he was a true theologian. He did not have knowledge about God, but the knowledge of God, which is inaccessible to the majority of people. The knowledge of God is a mountain steep indeed and difficult to climb. The majority of people scarcely reach its base. Only Moses was able to ascend the mountain of the vision of God and see God. I knew then that this Yerundas was a Moses, a man who had seen God. At the beginning I felt awkward. What could one talk about with him? What have we in common? Were we on the same wavelength? We are at the first stage of practical philosophy that is purification, whereas he has already passed from natural contemplation, that is illumination of the noose, to mystical theology or knowledge of God, that is to everlasting knowledge. We are full of passions, whereas he is the royal golden throne of the king. We personify hell. He is paradise. However, during our discussion, the ascetic came down from his height and raised me higher. He emptied himself and enriched me. Although he was rich, he became poor, so that by his poverty I might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, nine. For unity always demands a movement of, out of one's self, on both sides, which is also what happens in the union with God, a movement from God out of himself, as well as a movement from man out of himself occurs. This is the distinctive trait of divine love. Quote, Theologians at times call the divine an erotic force, sometimes love, and at other times that which is intensely longed for and loved. Consequently, as an erotic force and as love, the divine itself is subject to movement, and being that which is intensely longed for and loved, it attracts to itself everything that is receptive of this force and love, and quote St. Maximus the Confessor. The same father states further, quote, The divine erotic force also produces ecstasy, compelling those who love to belong not to themselves, but to those whom they love. This is shown by superior beings through the care of inferiors, by those of equal stature, through their support for each other, and by those of inferior status, through their divine return toward those who are highest, end quote. I always keep in my memory, and even more so in my heart, every single minute of that conversation. What follows is an account of how I met him and what we talked about. Sunset on Monathos the sun was sinking in the west. Mornings on Mount Athos are fragrant, charming. The darkness of the night is dispersed while the monks are in the Catholicon of the holy monasteries, singing, Glory to thee who has shown us the light. 
one could say that the sweetest melodious voices, the gentle sounding simandron, and the warm rhythm of the talandon drive away the darkness. And the afternoons on Athos are also peaceful. A day of struggle has passed, and night is spreading its veil now. The monk will hide within its many battles, abundant tears, and many forms of spiritual ascases. The sun goes down, but the sunlight which exists in the hearts of the ascetics is not extinguished. A ceaseless, luminous day exists in their completely pure hearts, without the cloud of passions. Oh, the sunset of Athos, sunsets full of charm, full of grace, wrapped up in silence. After vespers, a few monks, moving slowly with their faces bent toward the earth, come out of the Cathilicon of the holy monasteries, or out of the small chapels of their abodes, into the open air for some rest. They sit on a stone bench and meditate on the prayer, on the sweetest name of Christ. Their insistent desire is to inscribe it in their hearts in gold letters of prayer. I am carried away by these hours of tranquility, when even nature is calm and only the sea is heard sometimes playing on the rocks, when the king sun paints the sky in every color. Nature on Athos has a special charm, which is the radiance of prayer and holiness. Uncreated grace indeed passes through the soul to the body and spreads even to non-rational nature, to all creation. Nothing is fierce. Everything is calm. All night and all day Athos is consumed in prayer. Even nature itself is tamed by the beautiful voices of the monks, the sweet-sounding simantra, and by obedience. Nature does not attract me much, yet the nature of Mount Athos has a special grace. It might be that one sees it through the perspective of the deified monks and becomes illumined. It might be that one sees it not through the eye or the mind, but through the deified heart. And the heart knows how to love and how to appreciate things. It might be that Hezekiah, quietness in its fullest sense, plays a very significant part. Since, quote, life which is without anxieties, because of its hope in God, moves naturally toward an understanding of the creation of God. St. Gregory Palamas Ascending to my own Tabor Sunset on Athos While the sun was about to set, I was ascending in order to rise. The setting of the sun found me climbing with great difficulty a narrow and steep path toward the sunrise. Poor in faith, we find it very hard making such a sense, which are a delight to the faithful who have carried out their heroic decision to renounce the world with all its attractions and pleasures, and who have embraced asceticism. I was climbing somewhere on the north side of Athos. I wanted to put into practice the words of St. John Chrysostom, quote, while your desire is still warm, go away towards the, these angels and make it warmer for the words of men will not be able to fire your heart as the sight of heavenly things can." End quote. On the right and left rose forbidding rocks with their sharp peaks, as if they were piercing the sky like the voices and lives of the inhabitants of Manathos do. I was walking bent over, the Jesus prayer on my lips, in my heart, within my noose. For this is the way one should visit the holy mountain, feeling like a simple pilgrim, a short distance away from the path among the rocks, one could see small houses, which are the cells of the hermit monks. Some of them are within caves, others protrude a little, and you think when you look at them that they will fall into the sea. It is within these small caves that the spiritual bees live, making the sweetest honey of Hezekiah. The hymn which St. Nicodemus composed for the Athenite fathers came to my mind, and I started chanting it. O swarm of bees assembled by God, who make honeycombs of the very sweet honey of Hezekiah in the hollow places and caves of the holy mountain, as if in spiritual beehives. Similar cells exist on the south side of the mountain, in the area known as Kurulia. There the spectacle is incomparably more amazing. Quote, on the reddish surface of the rocks, which gives the appearance of being coated with rust, Many dwellings hang together at the summit at a terrifying height. Some of them are caves with their entrance obstructed by walls, allowing only for a small door. Elsewhere, a small projection of the rock 
has enabled a brave hermit to build a small chapel with a dome, one or two cells, and a tiny garden in which a wonderful bunch of little green trees has sprung from soil transported from another location, giving an exotic view to the landscape. The pure color with which all these hiding places are coated adds to the impression that they look like seagulls' nests. The ascetics communicate among themselves on precarious paths which are not visible from the sea. Climbing them, however, is a very bold decision. Many of the ascetics have not come out of their narrow courtyard for years. That is why there are small graveyards in the more spacious of the hermitages and cemeteries in the caves where the relics of the brothers are kept. On the forehead of each of the skulls, the name of the brother is inscribed, as well as the date of his death. End quote. Photius Contiglu. To continue, these spiritual seagulls, the doves of heaven, who experience God and ascend up to the third heaven, are scattered on the right and the left. Anyone who ascends that narrow path on the north side of the mountain, which I was climbing at sunset, notices the same spectacle, and it makes him tremble. He feels the grace of God close to him, refreshing him, but at the same time consuming him like Moses' burning bush. His memory brings to mind scenes of fathers from earlier times, who passed by that place and now sleep in peace and quietness, waiting for the voice of the archangel, for the coming of the bridegroom to whom they will be wedded. Undeniably, his heart is far from the world and all its pleasures. They had been fighting here for a whole lifetime so that they could find peace, and they found peace. They rest now in the bosom of Abraham, the voice of Christ, he is not dead, but sleeping, resounds loudly in those remote places. I was ascending with special thoughts and feelings. Quietness was predominant in the area. Once in a while you would hear the cries of wild birds flying overhead or even nightingales singing. Athos nurtures many beautiful nightingales, St. Nicodemus. Now and then sounds of dull th thuds could be heard. As I went on I reached a small house, and there I saw a peaceful hermit who was trying to break up a big rock. Evlogite yet unto your blessing, I said. The Lord bless you, he answered. This is the greeting on Manathos. When you ask for a blessing, they answer, O Kyrios. They know well the importance of Christ for the spiritual life. They also know their own weakness. The Lord is their desire and their true dwelling place. They often repeat his name, since they live in his presence. He is the one who is with them when they sleep and when they awake, and sweetens and delightens their heart through the consolation of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing there, Yerondas? I'm trying to break this rock, my son, in order to make a small reservoir and collect rainwater so that I can drink a little. Last year I suffered a lot from thirst. But that is very hard work, even more so without proper tools. What can I do? The body needs water. God will help me. We can do without everything else here in the desert, but a little water is necessary. Come to the cell and bless it for us. Me, to bless the cell of the blessed, I thought, the impure, to bless the purified. I entered the cell discreetly, with great respect. You enter the cell of a hermit with awe, as a place of mystery. It had not been cleaned and was untidy. But all these things are details for the spiritual athlete. How to find time for this sort of work. He brought me a little water and a Turkish delight, signs of his love. Indeed, in that desert you understand pure and sincere love. The whole heart of the monk is on that small tray with a little water and the sweet. He offers you everything. Have you come from the world? Yes. How is it in the world? This is the usual question you hear on Athos. This time, however, it is of great importance, because the monk who asks left the ill-omened world fifty years ago and has not gone back. Also, the ascetic knows well what the world means. It is the creation of God, yet at the same time it becomes the deceit of the devil. Did the devil not deceive Adam by using his handiwork? How many of us do not suffer the same thing? 
The world, Yenandus, has gone far astray from God. It does not remember him at all, neither does it live in a way worthy of him. The churches are empty, and all the places of the devil are full. People have left their spiritual fathers and have filled the psychiatric clinics. Their jobs give them anxiety, and all their occupations are mundane. Today we have elections, tomorrow the fall of the government, the day after congresses. People only read newspapers, and they are ignorant of the Bible. For hours on end they watch films inspired by the devil which put them to sleep. They do not learn about the lives of the saints. Poor, miserable world, the holy hermit said. The devil governs it. Daily he brings circumstances and events to steal away people's remembrance of Christ. He stops people looking inward at themselves and at their inner afflictions. He makes them interested in focusing on other people, not on themselves. This escapism enhances the anxiety you mentioned earlier. Adam sinned, hid himself, left God, and then all the sufferings followed. People do the same thing. I pray intensely for the salvation of the whole world. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and on your world. All night I pray that God may show his mercy on the world. This is our mission in this disturbed age. The lot falls upon us to become martyrs. That hermit told me many things. When you visit Athos, you will hear this sort of wisdom at every step you take. I thanked him. I asked for his blessing. I asked him to remember me in his prayers, and thoughtfully I came out of the cell which is now his grave, yet from which he will be resurrected to the true life. Encounter with the Hermit I continued my way to the heights, to the mountain of my transfiguration, and finally, after great effort, I reached the place which I wanted to visit. I stood outside for a little while to cool down. The cell of a hermit, I thought, is not only a place of mystery, but also a heavenly place. He who dwells there and occupies himself with Hezekiah in prayer is an apostle of Christ. St. Gregory Palamas says this in a homily to the Thessalonians. His starting point is what happened to the Apostle Thomas, who was not able to see the resurrected Christ on the Sunday of the resurrection, because he was not with the group of disciples. When, however, after eight days he joined the apostles, he saw the Lord, and the saint of God recommends, On Sunday and after the Divine Liturgy, take great care to find somebody who imitates the apostles of Christ and remains in retreat, and through prayer and quietness and chanting of hymns, desires Christ. If you find him, enter his cell in faith as a heavenly place, because it has the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, and remain there as long as possible. Talk with him about God and divine things. Ask guidance with humility, and invoke help through his blessing. Then the Lord Jesus will come to you too, invisibly, as in the case of Thomas. He will grant peace to your soul. He will add to your faith and give you support and he will count you among the chosen ones in the heavenly kingdom. Following the saint's instruction, I approached this particular cell, regarding it as a heavenly place. Inside I had the sense that the Yeranda was an apostle of Christ, who had already seen the risen Christ, and was now in the upper room in Jerusalem. Thus he was deified and was participating in the uncreated energies of God, and had everything that God has, yet without having his essence. Quote, he who is deified through grace acquires all that God has without also being identified with him in essence, and quote St. Gregory Palamas. How could I possibly see him differently since the God-seeing St. Gregory spoke about him like that? I had the desire, like Thomas, to see Christ. That is why I decided to approach him with great humility and contrition and to put into practice whatever he would tell me. As the reader will come to discern, I felt in my soul profound peace thanks to this conversation about God and things divine. I knocked on the outer door of his hermitage. Endless peace reigned there, which scared me a little. Some slow steps were heard. The door opened quietly, and one of the disciples of the Yeranda, who lived there, appeared in front of me. Your blessing, the Lord blesses you. I would like, if it is possible, to see the Yeranda. Is he busy? You should be very discreet when you visit a hermit. You may stop him praying. 
he may be in a state of divine rapture on Mount Tabor, and you may bring him down to the noisy earth. It is the worst thing you could do to him. He would not be distressed if you insulted him, but only if you called him down from the mountain. At the same time, however, that would be the best thing you could do for yourself because it would fill you with divine fragrance. The brilliance he was absorbed with would blind you. He emerges from prayer as if aflame, just as Moses shone when he came down from Sinai and the Israelites could not see him, or as iron is red hot after being removed from the fire. You experience a sweet scent of immortality. I will ask, the disciple said. He returned after a few minutes. Yet on this ill, but he will get up to see you. Let us go in if you wish. I sat a little with this young monk. I was moved by his presence in that rugged setting, by his life, his youth in that austere region. Although I did not know him, I felt admiration for him. Are there many of you here? I asked. The Yanandas and his three disciples. I would like to discuss a few things that have been preoccupying me. That is why I came here to this solitary place. It is good that you have done so. Pilgrims should come here with this sort of feeling. Some of them come here simply because of a superficial curiosity. They come to see the Yeranus in person, and then they boast of having seen him. These people make him exceedingly tired. He feels that they are like visitors to a zoo, like tourists. It is good then for you to ask spiritual questions and address problems that concern you, and you should know that you will not hear theories. He speaks from experience. Yananda lives these experiences and he speaks about them, some of them to his visitors in order to help them. No sooner had he finished than Father appeared before me, like the sun suddenly rising, like spring scattering joy, like lightning in the night. His white beard cascaded down from his face, his eyes penetrating, shining, brilliant. I've rarely seen such transfigured eyes. St. Gregory Palamas says that the apostles, before seeing the uncreated light on Mount Tabor, first had their eyes transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit so that they were able to see it. Do you understand? In front of this light, the eyes of those who see according to nature are blind. This light is not observable simply with the eyes of the senses. It is only discernible by those whose eyes are transfigured by the power of the Holy Spirit. They, the apostles, were changed, and thus they saw the change that our mortal nature has undergone, not at that moment, but from the time when it was assumed and deified through union with the word and logos of God. And this father, who had frequently seen the light of Tabor, had eyes transformed by this experience. The change was very distinct and a blessing to witness. Your blessing, I said, bending low to kiss his hand, which showed the marks of many prostrations. Yet he bent lower than I and kissed my hand first. I was stunned. But, Father, why have you done this to me, a useless servant of God, just one of the herd? Ah, you are a priest, and you have the grace of God. What do I have more than you? We who live in the wicked world are full of sins, whereas you in this desert enjoy the grace of God. You have become the temple of God his golden throne, a fiery cherubim. The scriptures are engraved three times on the breath of your heart so that you have the noose of Christ and you have become the living dwelling place of Christ in the spirit. How is it that you have done this to me? I was complaining as if I had been defeated and indeed I had been overcome by his saintliness and his humility. Quite often we are touched more deeply by a person's humility than by what he says. His love is more upsetting than his strictures. It seems to me that you do not know the way we think in the desert, he said, bowing his head. One of the characteristics of Hezekiah is awareness of one's sin. A man who watches himself every day sees such sinful states, such temptations of the devil within himself, that he feels himself to be truly the very worst of sinners. I want you to believe me, Father, Everyone who comes into my cell is holier than me. He is an angel of God. I said nothing. He grabbed me by the hand and leading me with great love as if I was blind, he took me to the little church. 
I felt at that time like a blind man in front of the dazzling light of the sun, powerless in front of a giant, a small child in front of a wise old man. This first action of guiding me by the hand was the prelude to another which would come a little later. How safe I felt with him! What indescribable grace! I can feel his warm hand even now. We went through two small doors where you had to bend down low in order to pass. Everything shows humility here. You should always enter the cell of a hermit bowed. You should forget who you were or who you are. There is no place here for people who think highly of themselves and are selfish. We came into the small chapel. He took me to venerate the icons of the iconostasis and the holy altar while he was lighting the small oil lamps, chanting at the same time the apolitipicon of the saint to whom the church is dedicated. The first thing they will tell you, whichever monastery or cell you go into, is to venerate the icons in the church and the first mark of friendship is to give you the holy relics to venerate. They are the most important things in a poor hermitage. They make it rich. The relics of the saints, which are preserved with so much reverence, show the absence of the saints from the world, but also their presence in the world by grace. When the soul of the saint leaves the body and reaches completion, the whole body receives divine grace. This is how the miracles of the holy relics and their fragrance are explained, St. Simeon the New Theologian. In this small chapel, the Yeranda and his disciples feel the kindness of the Lord and participate in the mystical supper. Later, he took me to a place which he said was his sitting room. There were a few stools and some books of the fathers, the Philokalia, the sayings of the fathers, St. Isaac the Syrian, St. Ephraim the Syrian, St. Gregory Palamas, etc. We sat down on two stools. He called me to come near him, and then he was enfolded in silence. Obviously, he was praying to God to enlighten me, to see myself clearly, and for himself to be illumined so that he would say what was needed. Discussion with the Yerundas on the Jesus Prayer Holy Father, I started in a low voice. A desire has taken hold of me very strongly lately. I believe that God has planted it. I want to be purified. I can see the passions running wild within me. I think my heart is a jungle which feeds many wild beasts. The devil is its master and does whatever he wants. I want to be free from this awful state. I would like to give my soul completely to God. I would like him to illumine it. I want it to be his. The devil has devastated it long enough. So I want to be purified, but I do not know how. Can you hear me, Yeranda? I want to be purified. Show me the way. I am ready to take it and obey it without question, whatever you tell me. I had started in a low voice, but ended up crying out and weeping. My last words must have sounded like thunder in the ears of the hermit. They were so loud. He kept silent for a while. He looked at me with much love. Only monks have this sort of love and know how to show it. He gave me the impression that I should not be troubled about this concern, for it was blessed. It is obvious, he said, that the Holy Spirit is present and acts within us when we experience such a state. We are beginning to make progress towards theoria and vision of God. It is the first stage of theoria. If the perfect theoria of the uncreated light is light enrapturing the soul, repentance and awareness of our sinfulness is fire-consuming the soul. Then repentance and the desire for the purification of the soul from the passions constitutes a time of grace. Only when grace enters within us can we see our desolation, how far we are from God, and we fight to be united with him. We are not able to have these thoughts and these desires if the grace of God does not visit us. He was a wise director, an experienced spiritual father, indeed a man full of grace. He knew, like the best doctor, how to calm you down, to give you peace, to give you a soothing medicine, not in order to leave you contented with your selfishness, but so that he could proceed to intervene and cure you. Now that we've clarified this point, he went on, I must also show you some methods, or rather one very simple method. 
Do not expect me to burden you with anything very difficult. Only the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. The unceasing cry to God our Savior purifies our soul. All our salvation rests upon the invocation of Jesus and union with him. Let us cry to him to come, and he will cure us by his coming. Let us groan like a sick man, and he, like a doctor, will come lovingly to our aid. Let us cry out like the man who fell among thieves, and the Good Samaritan will come to clean our wounds and guide us to the inn, that is, to theoria, to vision, of the, of the light, which consumes all our being. When God comes into our heart, he gains victory over the devil and cleanses the impurities which the evil one has created. The victory, therefore, over the devil is the victory of Christ in us. Let us do the human part by inviting Christ, and he will do the divine part by defeating the devil and purifying us. So we should not want to do the divine part ourselves and expect God to do what is our responsibility. We should understand this well. We do the human part, the Jesus prayer, and God, the divine part, our salvation. The entire work of the church is a collaboration of God and man. 1. The Significance of the Jesus Prayer If I have understood correctly, this is attained mostly through asceticism, watchfulness in the Jesus Prayer. Allow me, however, a question, not because I agree with it, but because I often hear people nowadays objecting to the Jesus Prayer. They say that the Jesus Prayer and the way it is practiced is a Christian yoga and is connected with prototypes in Eastern religions. What do you have to say about this? It seems that those who say this are completely ignorant of the grace-filled state of our church since we obtain divine grace through the Jesus Prayer. They have not experienced it, that is why they do not know it. Yet they should never accuse those who have experience. They blaspheme against the Holy Fathers as well. Many of the Fathers fought for the Jesus Prayer, and they spoke strongly about its value. What then? Did they fall into error? Did St. Gregory Palamas fall into error? They are even ignorant of the Holy Bible. Blind men said the words, Son of David, have mercy on us, which means Jesus have mercy on us, and their sight was restored, Matthew twenty thirty. Lepers said it, and they were cured of their leprosy. See Luke chapter 17, verse 13, and so on. The prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, consists of two basic points, dogma, acknowledgement of the divinity of Christ, and entreaty, supplication for our salvation. In other words, the confession of faith in Christ is connected with the confession of our inability to be saved of our own accord. This says everything. And the whole struggle of the Christian is based on these two points, faith in Christ and awareness of our sinfulness. The Jesus Prayer, therefore, expresses all the efforts of the faithful in a few words and summarizes all the dogmatic teaching of our Orthodox Church. We acquire twofold knowledge through the Jesus Prayer. St. Maximus points out that the passion of pride consists of two kinds of ignorance— the ignorance of the divine power and the ignorance of human weakness. And this double ignorance creates a confused state of mind. The proud man, therefore, is ignorant, whereas, on the contrary, the humble man has twofold knowledge. The latter knows his own weakness and the power of Christ, so we acknowledge and confess the power of Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, as well as our own weakness, have mercy on me through the Jesus Prayer. We acquire in this way the blessed state of humility. Where there is humility, there also is the grace of Christ, and this grace is the kingdom of heaven. Can you see then the significance of the Jesus Prayer? Can you see that we can obtain the kingdom of God by its power? I know, yet on a, that a prerequisite of Orthodox teaching is never to separate Christ from the other persons of the Most Holy Trinity, for this reason, we often invoke and glorify the whole Holy Trinity in the endings of the prayers and supplications during the Divine Liturgy, as if, for unto thee are due all glory, honor, and worship unto the Father, and unto the Son, and unto the Holy Spirit, now and forever. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with you all, etc. I wonder whether the Jesus prayer, which refers only to the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, deviates from this correct teaching. Answer. Definitely not, and I'll explain it to you further. The prayer is called the Jesus Prayer, but is founded on a Trinitarian basis. Moreover, Christ, being one person of the Holy Trinity, never exists without the Father and the Holy Spirit, and constitutes, together with the other persons, a trinity of one substance and undivided. Christology is tightly connected with teaching about the Holy Trinity. Let me come back to the matter of the Jesus Prayer. The Heavenly Father ordered Joseph through the angel to call Christ Jesus, and you shall call his name Jesus, Matthew 1, 21. Joseph, obeying the Father, called the Son of the Virgin Jesus. Also, according to the Holy Spirit, who illumined the Apostle Paul, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians twelve three. Therefore, by saying the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, we acknowledge the Father and are obedient to him. Moreover, we feel the energy of and communion with the Holy Spirit. The fathers illumined by the Holy Spirit have told us that the Father does everything through the Son in the Holy Spirit. The whole Holy Trinity created the world and made man. And again, the entire Holy Trinity recreated man and the world. The Father was well pleased. The Word became flesh and he became flesh by the Holy Spirit. That is to say, the incarnation of Christ came about by the goodwill of the Father and the cooperation of the Holy Spirit. For this reason, we say that the salvation of man and his acquisition of divine gifts are results of the common action of the Holy Trinity. I will mention two characteristic teachings of the Holy Fathers. St. Simeon, the New Theologian, writes that the Son and Word of God, the Logos, is the door of salvation, according to his declaration, quote, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. John 10, 9. If Christ is the door, the Father is the house. In my Father's house are many rooms. John fourteen two. So we enter into the Father through Christ. And in order to open the door, Christ, we need the key, which is the Holy Spirit. For we know the truth, which is Christ, through the energy of the Holy Spirit. The Father sent his Son to the world. The Son and Word, the Logos of God, reveals the Father and the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and is sent through the Son, forms Christ in our hearts. Therefore, we know the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. St. Maximus speaks often in his works about the mystical incarnations of the Word, he writes that just as the words of the law and the prophets were the forerunners of the coming of the word in the flesh, in the same way the Son and Word of God, being incarnate, became the forerunner of his spiritual advent by instructing souls through his own words to accept his divine and manifest coming. In other words, Christ must be incarnate within us, because we shall not be able to see his glory in heaven otherwise. The incarnation of Christ within us, however, comes about by the goodwill of the Father and the cooperation of the Holy Spirit. Can you see how the common action of the Holy Trinity is expressed, how we acknowledge and confess the great mystery that the Lord revealed through his incarnation? So anyone who denies and does not acknowledge the Jesus prayer makes a big mistake. He denies the Holy Trinity. He does not obey the Father and does not accept the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he does not have real communion with Christ, so he must be in doubt as to whether he is an Orthodox Christian or not. I would also, Yeranda, like you to explain to me and expand more on what I said was saying earlier, on the differences between the Jesus prayer and yoga, and for you to show me its superiority over the other Eastern religions, since you have great experience. This is a very big subject my son, and we could say many things about it. From what I said previously, the following points stand out. Firstly, in the Jesus prayer, faith in God, who created the world and who governs it and loves it, is strongly expressed. He is an affectionate father who cares about saving his mortal creation. Salvation is attained in God. For this reason, when we pray, we implore him by saying, 
have mercy on me. Self-redemption and self-deification are far from the athlete of noetic prayer because this was the sin of Adam, the sin of the fall. He wanted to become God outside of God's plan for him. Salvation is not attained through ourselves and does not emanate from ourselves, as the human philosophical systems claim, but is attained in God. Secondly, we are not struggling to meet an impersonal God through the Jesus prayer. We do not seek our elevation to absolute nothingness. Our prayer focuses on the personal God, the God-man Theanthropos, Jesus, and for this reason we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Divine and human nature meet in Christ, in other words, the fullness of the divine word and all of humanity. Quote, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 2.9 Therefore, anthropology and soteriology, that is, teaching about man and his salvation, in orthodox monasticism are closely connected with Christology. We love Christ and keep his commandments. We place great importance on this matter. We insist on the keeping of the commandments of Christ. He himself said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John fourteen fifteen. By loving Christ and by keeping his commandments, we are united with the entire Holy Trinity. Thirdly, we do not reach a state of pride through unceasing noetic prayer. The philosophical systems you mentioned before are possessed by pride. We acquire the blessed state of humility through the Jesus prayer. We say, have mercy on me, and we consider ourselves the worst of all. We despise none of our brothers. The athlete of the Jesus prayer is a stranger to every sort of pride, and whoever has pride is foolish. Fourthly, salvation, as we said before, is not an abstract notion, but union with God, the Holy Trinity, and the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This union, however, does not efface the human factor. We are not assimilated since we ourselves are also persons. Fifthly, as prayer develops, we acquire the ability to discern error. We can see and distinguish the movements of the devil, but at the same time, the energies of Christ. We recognize the deceit of the devil who often changes his form even into an angel of light. We distinguish, therefore, good from evil, the uncreated from the created. Sixthly, the struggle for the Jesus prayer is connected with the cleansing of soul and body from the corrupting effect of passions. We do not aim at reaching stoic apathy, but the dynamic state of dispassion. We do not aim at the mortification of the passions, but at their transformation. Without dispassion, we cannot love God and be saved, because love has been corrupted and distorted. We strive for its transformation. We fight to transform the distorted states that the devil created in us. We cannot be saved without this personal struggle, which is achieved with the help of the grace of Christ. According to St. Maximus, spiritual knowledge without praxis, that is purification of the heart, is the theology of the demons. Seventhly, we do not try to guide the noose, the noetic faculty, to absolute nothingness, through the Jesus prayer, but to turn it to the heart and bring the grace of God into the soul, from where it will spread to the body also. The kingdom of God is within us. Luke seventeen twenty one. According to the teaching of our church, it is our carnal way of thinking which is bad, and not our body. The body is not the garment of the soul, as the philosophical systems claim. We must not try to get rid of it, but we must try to save it. Salvation means redemption of the whole of man, of the soul and the body. We do not aim, therefore, at the destruction of the body, but we fight the worship of it. Neither do we want the destruction of life. We do not aspire to reach a point where we do not desire life so that suffering ceases. We practice the Jesus prayer because we thirst for life and we want to live with God eternally. Eighthly, we are not indifferent to the world around us. The various systems you mentioned before avoid facing the problems of mankind in order to maintain their peace and impassibility. We aim to do the opposite. We pray unceasingly for all. We are suppliants for the whole world. 
Moreover, salvation is union with Christ while we are in communion with other persons. We cannot be saved just by ourselves. A joy which is only ours without being joy for other people as well is not true joy. Ninthly, we do not place great importance on psychosomatic techniques and on various postures of the body. We consider that some of them assist in the concentration of the noose in the heart and in its essence, and as soon as this is achieved, we immediately do away with them all. I repeat, we do not strive for impassibility, a negative state, but for the acquisition of divine grace. Thank you very much, Yana, for these illuminating thoughts. They have great importance because they come from you, who know these things from experience. Allow me a question. Is purification and salvation, that is to say, deification, attained only through the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me? Are other prayers not appropriate? Do they not help? Every prayer has enormous power. It is a cry of the soul. Divine help comes according to our faith and fervor. There is liturgical prayer, individual prayer, and so on. The Jesus prayer, however, has boundless value because, as St. Isaac the Syrian says, it is that small key with the help of which we can enter into the mysteries which no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. That is, the Jesus prayer can keep the noose more in check and make it pray without imagination. The noose then becomes without color, without form, without shape, and receives much grace in a very short period. The Jesus prayer calls forth a lot of grace, even more than psalmody does, because it is closely connected with humility and the awareness of our sin. This is what the fathers tell us. St. Gregory of Sinai says, indeed, that psalmody is for those at the stage of praxis and beginners, whereas the Jesus prayer is for those who have tasted divine grace for the hesychists. Quote, you should not psalmodize often, for that causes unrest. To psalmodize often is appropriate for those engaged in praxis because of the toil it involves and the spiritual knowledge it confers. It is not appropriate for hesychists who concentrate wholly upon praying to God in their heart and avoiding all conceptual images. According to the Holy Fathers, he who has tasted grace should psalmodize sparingly, giving most of his time to prayer. But if he is attacked by laziness, he should psalmodize and or read the writings of the fathers. Usually, Father, he went on, confusion comes with psalmody, but it also brings selfishness and pride at having a beautiful voice due to the impressions that the others express, whereas there are no external factors for the appearance of pride when the believer says, Lord, have mercy on me in his cell. For this reason, the Hezekists mainly practice this sort of prayer, which our fathers taught us, and do matins and vespers with the prayer rope, repeating the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer is quite limited, very short. How can the noose be fixed on it? The noose concentrates more on short phrases, but the Jesus prayer has an immense depth which cannot be seen externally. The noose is accustomed to going deeply into anything that it concentrates on and to turn its love and desire in that direction. St. Maximus says, quote, The noose seeks to expand on the things it is fixed on, and it turns its love and desire to those things it expands on, either to what is divine and noetic, or to the flesh and the passions. End of quote. Moreover, the same thing happens with knowledge. Something that at first glance is simple can become a subject of lengthy study and research. How much more the sweetest name of Jesus? You can study it all your life. Since the Jesus prayer possesses such power, allow me, Yeranda, to ask you how it is done. How can someone enjoy it? I know that I may annoy you by being ignorant and illiterate in these matters, but you can help me a lot if you tell me this. The Jesus prayer is the greatest science, my son. It cannot be described precisely, nor can it be defined for fear of it being misunderstood or not being fully understood by those who have not had at least a little experience. It is indeed a great feat. I would even say that it is the highest form through which we acquire theology or rather the vision of God. 
Theology is the offspring and emanation of pure prayer, its wholesome and blessed fruit. The climate in which it develops and can be experienced is the quiet of the sweet desert, with all its dynamic content, as well as purification from passions. I have read yet under some books and articles referring to this work which is filled with grace, the work of noetic Hezekiah, the unceasing calling on the name of Jesus. But I would like you, since you have shown me its significance, to share with me some thoughts about it out of your own personal experience and the knowledge of the fathers. I do not want to learn simply because of curiosity, but because of my zeal to experience as much as I can this blessed state. Please do not refuse my wish. Two, the stages of the Jesus prayer. I referred to something before. Noetic prayer mainly requires renunciation of the world, submission to a yerunda, a decision by the monk to remain in exile and to keep the commandments of Christ for a long period of time. In the beginning, our attention concentrates on the fulfillment of the commandments of Christ and is occupied in practicing abstinence and obedience. We know from the teaching of our Holy Fathers that virtues do not unite man with God perfectly, but they create the appropriate climate so that the prayer comes and unites man with God, the Holy Trinity. Virtues are a prerequisite for the granting of much grace, yet they also offer grace. When, therefore, the Yeranda, who has experience of the Jesus prayer, realizes that his disciples' will has been cut off and he has been cleansed from the gross passions, only then does he decide to initiate him in the Jesus prayer. Even then, however, he does not tell him everything, but only as much as he can endure and carry out. He guides him little by little in case he may fall into disappointment or error. What are these stages? Which are the mystical steps which bring us to perfect union with Christ and to the enjoyment of deifying grace? The basic purpose of the Jesus prayer is to unify the whole of man who has become fragmented. Please forgive me for the interruption. What does unification of the whole man mean? Man, according to Scripture, has been created in the image of God, Genesis 1.26. God is a trinity, that is, one essence in three hypostases, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thus the soul, being created in the image of God, is single as well as manifold. It has three powers, nous, desire, the appetitive power, and will, the insensive power. All three must be united and be directed to God. According to St. Maximus, their development, according to nature, is for the noose to have the knowledge of God, for the appetitive power to desire and love only God, and for the insensitive power to carry out the will of the Lord. In this way the commandment is fulfilled, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Mark 12.30 When the noose remains in God, it stirs up the appetitive power to love him and the incessant power to fight against the evil spirits and seek for purification. So unity exists because an impetus towards God exists. Well then, sin tears up the unity of the three powers of the soul. The noose comes to ignore God. The appetitive power loves created things and not the creator. And the insensive power is submitted to the tyranny of the passions. Thus we have the complete enslavement of the soul. St. Gregory Palamas describes this state very well. Firstly, the noose moves away from God and turns to created things. Whenever we open a door to the passions, the noose is immediately scattered, wandering all the time among carnal and worldly things, among manifold pleasures, and the impassioned thoughts which go with them. Secondly, the noose fallen away from God leads desire astray from God and his commandments. When the noose rebels, desire is also scattered in fornication and foolishness, shared out between both evils. Once the noose has been enfeebled, the soul's ability for real love falls away from what is truly desired and, torn between various longings for sensual pleasures, is dispersed, pulled this way and that by desires for superfluous foods, dishonorable bodies, useless objects, 
and empty and glorious glory. Thirdly, the will is submitted to the passions and is tormented and becomes enraged. Man who was destined to be a child of God becomes a murderer, being comparable not only to a wild beast, but also to a reptile or a venomous animal. He becomes a scorpion, a snake, an offspring of vipers. Therefore, the three powers of the soul depart from God. But at the same time, they lose their unity with each other. The appetitive power wants to return to God, but the incisive power does not allow it. Desire wants to return, but the noose not believing in God does not want to love God. We strive for this return and attain it finally through the Jesus prayer. The return to God starts with the concentration of the noose. Our aim is to detach the noose from its attraction to surrounding objects and bring it back to itself so that the desire is brought back. I think you have described it to me very vividly and I have understood. It is the Holy Fathers that describe these things, not me, my son. After my interruption and your explanation, can you please tell me the stages of the prayer more analytically? Where does a person start and how does he progress? There are primarily five stages. Firstly, reciting the Jesus prayer vocally. We repeat the Jesus prayer with our lips while trying at the same time to focus our attention on the words of the prayer. Secondly, the noose takes the Jesus prayer and says it noetically. This is noetic prayer. Our whole attention is centered again on the words, but is concentrated in the noose. When the noose gets tired, we start again to vocalize the prayer with the lips. This method, of course, or the use of the prayer rope, is still the elementary level of the Jesus prayer. A beginner should start, however, from this stage, and when he reaches what is more perfect, what is less perfect will then fade away. After the noose has rested, we start again to concentrate our attention there. St. Nilos advises, Always remember God and your noose will become heaven. Thirdly, the Jesus prayer then descends into the heart. Noose and heart are united. The attention now is centered in the heart and is immersed again in the words of the Jesus prayer and primarily in the name of Jesus which has unfathomable depth. Fourthly, the prayer now becomes automatic. It is prayed while the ascetic is working, eating, discussing, or while he's in church or even while he is sleeping. I sleep, but my heart wakes, as Holy Scripture says in Song of Songs 5.2. Fifthly, the person praying feels a divine soft flame burning within his soul and making it joyful. The grace of Christ lives in the heart. The Holy Trinity dwells within it. We become the dwelling place of God when he is established within us by means of the memory. Thus we become the temple of God when remembrance of him is not disturbed by earthly cares and the mind is not distracted by unexpected thoughts. Fleeing all these things, the friend of God withdraws to him, chasing away the passions which invite him to self-indulgence and occupying himself in a way which leads to virtue. Thus he feels the divine presence within himself, and this grace passes to the, his body, which becomes dead to the world and is crucified. And this is the highest stage, which is sometimes connected with the theoria of the uncreated light. This is essentially the course of the development of the Jesus prayer. Each stage has a corresponding grace. Yerund, allow me to ask a few questions which arose while you're talking about the stages of the Jesus prayer. What do you mean by the word heart? According to the teaching of the Holy Fathers, the heart is the center of the spiritual world. Among the many opinions of the Fathers on this subject, I will mention a distinctive one of St. Epiphaninos, Bishop of in Cyprus, quote, For this reason, we need not in any way define or ascertain in what part of man the image of God is accomplished, but we need to confess that the image of God does exist in man, so that we will not despise the grace of God and disbelieve in him. For whatever God says is true, although his word has to a certain extent escaped our capacity to conceive it. Just as a beam of light when it falls upon a prism is refracted and visible from all sides, in the same way the soul expresses itself through the whole human being. And we say the Jesus prayer, however, we fix our attention on the physical organ, on the heart, 
so that our attention is drawn away from the outside world and brought back again into ourselves, into the deep heart. In this way, the noose, one of the powers of the soul, returns to its home and is united there with the other powers. Allow me a second question. Do all who are enchanted by the enjoyment of God follow the course you have just described to me? Yes, most of them do. There are some, however, who from the very beginning seek to unite the noose with the heart by doing breathing exercises. They breathe in the words, Lord Jesus Christ, and exhale the words, have mercy on me. They follow the air as it comes into the nose all the way to the heart, and there they rest a little. This, of course, is done to allow the noose to be fixed on the prayer. The Holy Fathers have also handed over to us another method. We breathe in saying all the words of the Jesus prayer, and we breathe out saying all the words again. This method, however, requires maturity and spiritual development. By using this way of breathing can cause many difficulties, many problems. That is why it should be avoided, except under the supervision of a spiritual father. It can be used, however, simply to fix the noose on the words of the prayer so that the noose is not distracted. I repeat, this needs the special blessing and permission of a discerning spiritual father. You said before, Yananda, that the aim of the Jesus prayer is to bring the noose back into the heart, that is, the energy into the essence. We can experience this specifically at the third stage of this holy journey. When, however, you recounted the fifth stage, you referred to a quotation of St. Basil the Great. Fleeing all these things, the friend of God withdraws to him. How does the noose come into the heart and depart towards God? Is this perhaps a contradiction? No, no it is not, the holy hermit answered. As the holy and God-bearing fathers teach, those who pray are at various stages. There are beginners as well as advanced, or as they are called, better called in the teaching of the fathers, those at the stage of praxis and those at the stage of theoria. For those engaged in praxis, prayer is born of fear of God and a firm hope in him, whereas for those who have attained to theoria, prayer is engendered by an intense longing for God and by total purification. The characteristic of the first degree of prayer associated with praxis is the concentration of the noose within the heart, when the noose prays to God without distraction. The characteristic of the second degree of prayer associated with theoria is the rapture of the noose by divine light, so that it is aware neither of the world nor of itself. This is the ecstasy of the noose, and we say that at this stage the noose departs to God. The God-bearing fathers who experienced these blessed states describe divine ecstasy as the enrapturing of the noose by the divine and infinite light, so that it is aware neither of itself nor of any other created thing, but only of him whom through love has activated such radiance in the noose. Allow me another question. I was not able to understand the quotation you mentioned before, I sleep but my heart wakes. Please be so kind as to explain it to me. How is it possible that the heart continues to pray while someone is sleeping? This passage is from the Old Testament book called Song of Songs. It is not difficult to explain. The prophet David says that man's heart is deep, Psalm 64, 6. All the events, all the impressions of the day and the occupations of the mind go into the depths of the heart, into what we call nowadays the subconscious. So whatever man is occupied with during the day, the heart will be occupied with these same things at night, when the mind and the human energies rest. And this can be seen clearly in our dreams. St. Basil says that to a great extent, fantasies during sleep, dreams are an echo, a reflection of our daily thoughts. Evil occupations and thoughts during the day create evil dreams. The same also happens with good deeds. The ascetic or the man of God in general thinks of God all day through the Jesus prayer. The remembrance of God by the repetition of the Jesus prayer is his delight. He does everything, whether he eats or drinks, for the glory of God, according to the word of the apostle, 1 Corinthians 10.31. It is natural, therefore, that his heart thinks of God and prays even during the few hours of nightly rest. His heart is ever awake.
three ways of praying the Jesus Prayer. Thank you very much, Yerona, for these vivid explanations. Thus far, I have been able to follow you more or less. I can hold in my mind the stages of the prayer, that is, how this holy practice evolves. But I would like to ask if this work is done without any labor. Are not struggle and force needed? If the kingdom of God has suffered violence and men of violence take it by force, Matthew eleven twelve, is it not necessary for violence to be used with regard to the Jesus prayer too? since it brings a taste of the kingdom of God. For as I read in St. Gregory Palamas, the theoria of the uncreated light is the kingdom of heaven. Where then does the struggle lie? Certainly struggle is needed, said the wise Athenite. In fact, the spiritual athlete must shed a lot of blood. In this case, the saying of the Father applies, Give your blood, receive the Spirit. Even Adam, who was in the state of Theoria of God, lost paradise because he did not struggle. How much more is struggle needed for us in order to make divine grace our own? Those who claim that struggle is not needed are mistaken. Spiritual knowledge without praxis is the theology of demons, according to St. Maximus. Prayer was done effortlessly before the fall, as, for example, the un unending glorification by the angels. After the fall, however, struggle and effort are required. The righteous in the king kingdom of God will return to that previous state. I would like very much for you to describe this struggle to me. The first and major struggle is for man to collect his noose, to detach it from the things around him, from objects, situations, events, bad thoughts, or even good ones. For when the noose departs from, from God, it loses its life. It becomes dead like the fish out of water. This is what St. Isaac the Syrian says, That which happens to the fish which has come out of the water happens to the noose when it comes away from the remembrance of God and is distracted into the remembrance of the world. After the fall, the noose is like a dog that wants to run all the time and is extremely agile at escaping. It is like the prodigal son in the parable who wants to go away from his paternal home, takes his property with him, that is his desire and will, disperses it and squanders it in loose living. This is what the fathers say, especially St. Gregory Palamas, who, as we said before, experienced this inner life. It is a good thought, I exclaim, but how can the noose be gathered? Exactly as happened with the prodigal son. What do we read in this particular chapter? But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And he arose and came to his father. But the father said to his servants, Bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Luke chapter 15, verses 17 to 24. The prodigal noose, too, needs to come to itself from its distraction, to feel the sweetness and the happiness of the paternal home and return to it where the great feasts will be. It will feel exceeding joy. The voice saying, My son was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, will be heard, and the dead noose will be made alive. Only when the noose comes into the heart, joy is created, like when someone who has been living abroad returns to his home, writes Nikiforos the monk. But exactly as a man who has been living abroad when he returns home does not know what to do for joy at meeting his wife and children once again, in the same way the noose, when united with the soul, is filled with ineffable joy and pleasure. The concentration of the noose is achieved by the warming up of the heart, my venerable Yerundus would sit for a little while when the sun was setting, take images from his inner state and from nature, and then his heart being warmed up, he would begin reciting the Jesus prayer until the morning hours when the divine liturgy started. Then, Yerundus, excuse me for the interruption, I could not follow you very well. What does it mean he was warming up his heart? How does the heart get warmed up and why is this work necessary for the Jesus prayer? The example of the prodigal son will help you. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger. 
I will arise and go to my father. That is, he thought of the prosperity of his paternal home, but at the same time of his own miserable state, and he was prompted immediately to return to his father. He made great effort to force his will and desire to want the return. We do the same for the Jesus prayer. We try to become aware of our sinfulness, of our miserable state. We see the misdeeds of the day. We examine the various events and our sins, but only on the surface that is externally, and we feel as if we are in court and on trial. God is the judge, and we are sitting in the dock as the accused. With such feelings, the cry, on me, have mercy on me, begins. In this case, we must weep, because undistracted prayer comes through crying. The fathers say that if someone wants to obtain deep prayer and even deep monastic life, he must learn to weep and to experience self-incrimination, self-reproach, in all its intensity, to consider himself worse than any other, to consider himself as a dirty animal which lives in the darkness of error and ignorance. He should be distinguished for the talent of taking the prosecutor's part against himself, as St. Basil the Great says. He should blame himself for his sins and not wait for the reproaches of others, being the plaintiff against himself, taking the prosecutor's part. In other words, he should condemn himself first, as it is said in the Proverbs of Solomon, and in this way prepare himself for prayer. St. Isaac the Syrian writes that before we start praying, we fall to our knees, put our hands behind our backs, and consider ourselves condemned. Then a thought of self-reproach comes. Each time it may be different. We must concentrate on this thought and then muse it on it in a way that is free from fantasy. Then indeed the noose descends into the heart in repentance. We start crying and praying undistractedly. Let me use an example from worldly life. As soon as a man of the world remembers the wrong that someone has done him and works on this thought, he feels a pang in his heart and begins to cry immediately. The same thing happens with him who practices the Jesus prayer without having these worldly and selfish thoughts. He thinks, I have grieved Christ. I have distanced myself from divine grace. The heart can be wounded deeply by such a feeling. And when the heart is wounded by the sense of repentance, not by external force, it hurts more than a physically wounded body. This wound holds the noose in God continually, and he who is wounded cannot sleep even at night, feeling that he is sitting on burning coals. It is possible, therefore, for him to say the Jesus prayer intensely for a quarter of an hour, and his wounded heart will remember Jesus all day and all night. This is called unceasing prayer. I repeat, he can achieve this after a few minutes of intense prayer with tears and feel the energy of the Jesus prayer within himself for many days. I must emphasize that the awareness of our unworthiness is absolutely necessary for the Jesus prayer to act within us. The more the awareness of our sinfulness increases, the greater our progress. Without this awareness, true prayer does not exist. So prayer should be connected with mourning. Indeed, the fathers teach that the ascent to heaven is connected with the descent into ourselves. The more we sink our attention deep into the soul, the more we find our secret heart. Through repentance, the kingdom of heaven descends into the heart and makes it paradise and heaven. The ex exhortation, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2, is always in force. Only through repentance are we led to the vision of the kingdom. Question, is there any possibility of the man who becomes aware of his sinfulness being disappointed and abandoning the fight? Answer, of course this is possible. If this happens, it means that the devil put the idea of sinfulness in his mind to lead him into despair. When becoming aware of our sinfulness, we turn to God and ask for his grace through prayer. It means that this is a gift from God, an energy of the grace of Christ. Apart from the awareness of sinfulness the Yeranda went on, there are other ways of warming up the heart. There is the remembrance of death. These are my last hours, he thinks, and the demons will come in a little while to take my soul. This thought, when free from fantasy, causes fear and urges us to prayer. Abba Theoph Theoph 
Phyllis recommends something which is written in the sayings of the fathers that shows more or less how we can think. Quote, what fear, what trembling, what uneasiness will there be for us when our soul is separated from the body? Then indeed the force and strength of the adverse powers come against us, the rulers of darkness, those who command the world of evil, the principalities, the powers, the spirits of evil, they accuse our soul as in a lawsuit, bringing before it all the sins it has committed, whether deliberately or through ignorance, from its youth until the time when it was taken away. So these adverse powers stand accusing the soul of all it has done. Furthermore, what anxiety do you suppose the soul will experience at that hour and until sentence is pronounced and it gains its liberty? That is its hour of affliction until it sees what will happen to it. On the other hand, the divine powers stand facing the adversaries, and they present the good deeds of the soul. Consider the fear and trembling of the soul, standing between them until its sentence is pronounced by the righteous judge. If it is judge worthy, the demons will receive their punishment, and it will be carried away by the angels. Then thereafter it will be without disquiet, or rather it will live according to that which is written, even as the habitation of those who who rejoices in thee. Then will the scripture be fulfilled. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah 51, 11. Then the liberated soul will go on to that joy and ineffable glory in which it will be established. But if it is found to have lived carelessly, it will hear that terrible voice. Take away the ungodly, that he may not see the glory of the Lord. Then the day of anger, the day of affliction, the day of darkness and shadow seizes upon it. Abandoned to outer darkness and condemned to everlasting fire, it will be punished through the ages without end. Where then is the vanity of war? Where is vainglory? Where is carnal life? Where is enjoyment? Where is imagination? Where is ease? Where is boasting? Riches, nobility, father, mother, brother, who can take the soul out when it is burning in the fire, remove it from the bitter torments? Other befitting thoughts are those associated with the feeling of the sweetness of paradise and the glory of the saints, as well as the great love of God, especially on the day when someone partakes of the holy mysteries. Yet on the when people hear of such thoughts, they express doubts and disbelief. There are also many theologians and even spiritual fathers who disagree on these points. That is, they claim that all these things are not for the people living in the world. They even make use of the Holy Fathers. They divide the Fathers into niptic and social categories. They praise those who are called social because their teaching is more down-to-earth, whereas the teaching of the niptic Fathers is, they think, for monasteries. I do not know what to extent these opinions are true. You are touching on a big subject with many ram ramifications, and therefore it requires a lot of time. Yet I cannot help but offer some general answers. First of all, my son, it is not possible to divide the fathers into watertight, niptic, and social categories, as it is not possible to divide theology into mystical and non-mystical, or spiritual life into secular and monastic, by alleging, for example, that some teachings apply to lay people and some to monks. It is not possible, because all the theology of the Eastern Orthodox Church is niptic, and all spiritual life is ascetical. All of the Holy Fathers, therefore, have a common way of thinking, a common life, a common teaching. All of them have acquired the blessed state of deification, they have been incorporated into Christ and have become themselves Christ. And the Holy Spirit acts in them. So the niptic fathers are always social as well, and the so-called social ones are necessarily niptic. The fact that the fathers are social flows from the fact that they are niptic. Those of them who are engaged in social concerns are not simply sociologists or psychologists or moralists or pedagogues, but theologians in the fullest sense of the word. They themselves first experience God, and then they try to help man to experience him. Their sociability, therefore, 
is a dimension of theology that is of life in Christ, which is the life in the Holy Spirit and the life in the Church. The Church is the realm of Orthodox theology, and theology is the voice of the Church. All the Fathers had points in common. They had, that is, Orthodox theology, the mind of the Church, and lived either as priests or as monks. It is a big mistake, therefore, to divide them into watchful, niptic, and social because this division has many consequences in the spiritual life and ends up in blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Do you not think that there are some fathers like St. Basil or St. John Chrysostom who talked a lot about social problems and thus come nearer to the people? Yes, certainly. Yet, as I said before, a few necessary explanations must be given. Firstly, the fact that they talked about social problems does not mean that they did not live with prayer watchfulness, and tears. Their teaching about social problems should not be separated from their inner life. We should not split up the life and teaching of a Holy Father, because otherwise he could be mistaken for a sociologist or moralist. And there is a great difference between a sociologist and a theologian. Their motives and starting points are different. Their anthropology is very different. Secondly, if some of the Fathers talked more about social problems, they did it because they had instruction from God that they should talk in this way to a, a specific person in a specific place. We should not forget that the word of the prophet, of the apostle, and of the saint is spoken according to the maturity and the spirituality of the people they address. If the word is imperfect, this is not because of the different approach or mentality of the Holy Father, but is due to the inability of the people to grasp something loftier. It is not that the Father does not know but that the flock is unable to grasp it. Not to mention that in many patristic works which have a social content, the hesychist's spirit is also clearly present. Let me take the case of St. John Chrysostom, whom you mentioned before to be more specific. St. John Chrysostom is considered a social father and appropriate to be read by people in the world. Many refer to his teaching about various social and moral questions, yet they forget that the same father lived in a hesychistic and ascetical way, with watchfulness, with tears and mourning, with unceasing prayer, with the remembrance of death. If a hesychist monk reads his works, he immediately senses the hesychist father. I shall quote a passage from his holy teaching and then try to make some comments. He talks about prayer, about prayer in general and its value. He says that in order to be fruitful, it should be done with concentrated noose and heart, wounded by the feeling of repentance. Quote, Prayer is a great weapon, an unfailing treasure, wealth that is never consumed, a tranquil harbor, a source of peace, the root, the spring and mother of countless good things, more powerful than an earthly kingdom. And by prayer, I do not mean merely formal prayer, which is filled with negligence, but that which is done with ardor, with an afflicted soul, with an earnest mind, for this is the prayer which ascends to heaven. Let us then warm up our conscience and afflict our soul by the remembrance of our sins. Afflict our soul, not in order to grieve it, but in order to make it heard, in order to make it vigilant and even touch heaven. Nothing drives away negligence and indolence so much as affliction and suffering, which gather the noose from all around and make it return to itself. He who is thus afflicted and prays makes great joy dwell in his soul after prayer. He goes on to say that a person acquires boldness in prayer only when he is convinced that he is the worst of all. The greatest hesychist would have spoken in the same way, Father, the yet underwent on. A few points about this text are noteworthy. Firstly, he connects prayer closely with affliction of the soul and with the effort of the noose. The noose must return to itself from its distraction so that the prayer may become wholehearted. Secondly, it is necessary to begin by warming up the heart, as we said before, for prayer to act effectively. The heart becomes warm, the noose returns, and prayer is given to us. Thirdly, we warm up our heart with the remembrance of sins, with self-reproach, with the feeling that we are the worst of all, the lowest of all creation. Only when we live prayer in this way can we receive spiritual joy, the grace of Christ. Can you see now that St. John Chrysostom is a hesychist father. 
I was astonished by the reading and analysis of this passage from St. John Chrysostom. I was impressed by this opinion of the Holy Father. May I make a correction? Certainly you may. This is not a personal opinion of St. John Chrysostom, but the teaching of the Church addressed through him. We cannot speak about the opinions of the Fathers as if they were philosophers, sociologists, or moralists, but about the teaching of the Fathers as members of of the glorious body of Christ who receive the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Living in the church, we overcome our individuality. We become persons activated by the Holy Trinity. Our noose is illumined and becomes the pulpit of the Holy Spirit. Every great work in the church starts with submission. The fathers submitted themselves freely to God. They suffered change for the better and became instruments of God. They lived and then they spoke in order to help other people too. Thank you for the correction. Be kind enough also to explain something to me. We said before that when a Hezekist monk reads St. John Chrysostom, he's able to discern in him the niptic father. Why then do we see them only as social fathers, strangers to this kind of inner life? Answer. This happens because the Holy Spirit does not act richly within us. The Holy Scriptures and the works of the Fathers were written through the inspiration of the Most Holy Spirit, and therefore they are interpenetrated and grasped, interpreted and grasped only through His illumination. He who has the mind of the Fathers, he who has the Holy Spirit, by reading any of the Fathers and any of their work, senses the Hezekist, the Niptic, the one who has known the Lord and the Holy Spirit. The saints are only recognized by saints because they have the same kind of life, common experiences, common ways of expressing themselves. They understand the grace which acts in a holy father only through the way he expresses himself. Someone who has, who has known the vision of God, for example, reading the prayers of the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, understands immediately that St. Basil, although he does not say it openly, saw the uncreated light. When, however, sociologists or ethicists, without having the Holy Spirit, study the works of the fathers, they divide and separate them. And I think that this isolated, fragmentary use of quotations from the fathers outside the spirit of asceticism in order to support our impure and human-centered thoughts is the greatest heresy. When we look at the fathers outside the spirit of asceticism, of repentance, we cannot interpret them. And every misinterpretation is a change for the worse. All of the heretics did the same. They used passages without understanding them, without having the prerequisites for interpreting them correctly. We should therefore put into practice the watchword which prevails in our times, return to the fathers. Not only by studying the texts of the fathers, but also by making the effort to acquire the life of the fathers. We should live in the Holy Church, Live with the holy mysteries and the holy virtues. Stop being individuals and start living like persons, as worthy members of Christ. At that moment, the disciple, filled with grace, came over to us to ask what he should offer me. The Yerundas had been completely absorbed and had forgotten to observe the obligatory courtesy of the monks. Monks offer you something as a welcome, so that you will bless it and accept at the same time the blessing of their cell. The spiritual conversation was so absorbing that he had completely forgotten. Yes, bring something for our guest. What shall I bring, Yanana, a Turkish delight, a sweet, or something else? After giving the proper order, the Yanana began to praise the disciple. I was not worthy of having such disciples. God had pity on me for my sins, and he sent me angels. I do not have disciples, but angels who serve me. How should I thank the Most High God, especially this disciple who just came in? He has the thoughts of a small child, and this is absolutely necessary for the work of noetic prayer, which we are talking about. The Holy Fathers teach that if somebody wants to be saved, he must either become a fool, we are fools for Christ's sake, 1 Corinthians 4.10, or a child, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18.3. All of us, even if we have committed the greatest sins, can acquire, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, spiritual youth 
and the mind of a child with regard to sin. The law of the spiritual life is contrary to the law of the life of the flesh. By living the life of the flesh, a man becomes old little by little, whereas in the spiritual life, although a man is old because of his sins, he becomes young, a child again. The disciple brought the blessing of the cell on a tray, a Turkish delight and a little water. I took the glass in my hands, asked the Yerinda for his blessing, and said, Please pray for me that I become a child or a fool. Ways of Praying the Jesus Prayer Continued There are moments in life when you are not able to pray for anything because speech ceases, and then you feel the need only to seek prayers and blessings. You experience this on the holy mountain, and this is why you do not pray, but ask for prayers. Your blessing, Evlogite, the Lord bless you, they answer, O Kyrios. They say neither good morning, nor good afternoon, nor good night. The only other greetings are basically, be of good patience, have a good vigil, good paradise, may you have a good end. While I was saying your blessing and eating a very sweet Turkish delight, I was saying within myself, may you live many years, Yerunda. May you live so that we too, who are sinners, may live. Deep silence prevailed. I realized that the Yerunda was saying the Jesus prayer. He was in such a posture that it was obvious he was held wrapped by God. I find it very difficult to talk, but I had to. Yerunda, allow me to interrupt you by going on. I know that my presence is in a way strange in these surroundings. I am a parasite which makes your life difficult. And No, no, do not say that, because we receive you like our brother, who lives in the world and fights the good fight and has grace from God. How can the grace which we have be compared with your grace? Even so, you have more grace than we have, because where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Romans 5.20 God sends more of his mercy to hold you in his love. God loves you more. I accept this as an expression of your humility, I said, having been won over by so much love and so much humility. I would like to go on, however, because we, we come to obtain benefit even up to the last minute. You were talking before about the warming up of the heart, that this is achieved through the thought of hell, of paradise, and of our sinfulness. Yet does it not create problems? Like you were saying earlier, that our prayer should be free from imagination. Our noose should be formless, but perhaps these images obstruct pure prayer. Answer. First of all, I would like to emphasize that these thoughts are not just simply thoughts. They are not fantasy, but noetic work. We do not simply think, but we live. For example, thinking once of hell for a few minutes that this is the most proper place for me, because of my numerous sins, I found myself in that desperate darkness. I experienced unbearable pain and inexpressible anguish. After I recovered from that state, all of my cell stunk. You cannot understand the stink of Hades and the suffering of the damned. I realized then more than ever that I was in the presence of a holy Yerunda who keeps his noose in hell. I let him go on without the slightest comment. The warming up of the heart by these thoughts is done before prayer, because when the heart starts praying after it has been warmed, any further thought on these matters is forbidden, and we try to fix the noose and the heart on the words of the Jesus prayer. In this way we achieve a state of noose free from fantasy which the fathers talk so much about. That is, for the noose to be free from any form and from any imaginings prayer is a struggle. It strengthens the fight of the Christian against the devil, but it is itself also a painful and bloody struggle. All our effort must be concentrate our, word, our noose on the words of the Jesus prayer. We should make our noose deaf and mute to any thought, either good or bad, that the evil one brings us. We should not listen to the thoughts that come from outside or answer them. We need to despise them completely and not converse with them. Thus, we should seek in every way the complete muteness of our noose, because only with this action can we keep our soul in calmness so that the Jesus prayer can act effectively. It is known that our thoughts progress from the noose into the heart and disturb it. 
The troubled noose also troubles the soul. Just as the wind raises the waves in the sea, so the wind of thoughts raises waves in the soul. Attentiveness is necessary for prayer. That is why the fathers talk about prayer in combination with watchfulness. Watchfulness keeps the noose in a constant state of alertness and readiness, and prayer brings divine grace. For this purpose, we use various ways. Before we start the holy work of the Jesus prayer, let us remember that while we're praying, ardent desire, perseverance and hope, much zeal, and immense patience combined with faith in the love of God are demanded of us. We begin with, Blessed is our God. We say, O Heavenly King, Comforter the Chosagian. Then we recite the 50th Psalm, the Psalm of Repentance, with contrition and compunction, immediately followed by the Creed. Then we strive to concentrate our noose by means of quiet and silence. We warm up our heart with various thoughts, free from fantasy, as we said before. And after it has been warmed, perhaps after having shed tears, we start the Jesus Prayer. We say the words slowly and try to stop our noose from escaping and to keep track of the words. The words should follow one another without the intervention of other thoughts and events. After eleis on me, after have mercy on me, we should say immediately, Kyrie Yesu Christe, Lord Jesus Christ, so that a chain is formed and the interference of the devil is avoided. You should know that the devil will try to break the unity of the words at all costs and enter into the noose and heart. He will try to make only one small opening in order to put a bomb, a thought, and blow up all this holy effort. However, we must not allow him in. We must say the Jesus prayer loudly, vocally, so that the ears will also hear it, because this helps the noose to concentrate more. Another way is to say the prayer in the noose and in the heart very slowly, to stop for a while after the have mercy on me, eleis on me, and then, when our attention has weakened, to start again from the beginning. If, while warming up our heart, we used thoughts about our sinfulness, it would be good, the fathers recommend, to add the word, the sinner, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We should stress the word to feel it more. Yet, because the news can get tired of reciting the entire Jesus prayer, it is necessary to make it shorter. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Yesu Christe, eleis on me. Or, Kyrie eleis on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Or, Lord Jesus, Kyrie Yesu. As the Christian progresses in the work of the Jesus prayer, he can decrease the words. He can even sometimes insist on the word Jesus, which he says repeatedly. And then a wave of calmness and joy may arise in him. He should remain in this climate of sweetness which has appeared and not stop the prayer, even if his usual rule of prayer has finished. He should seize and keep this warmth of his heart and take advantage of this gift of God. For it is a great gift which God sends from on high, the warmth of the heart helps the noose effectively to be fixed on the words of the Jesus prayer, to come down into the heart and remain there. If someone wants to spend all day in prayer, he should follow the recommendation of the Holy Fathers. He should pray for an hour, read for an hour, and then again spend an hour in prayer. When he is engaged in manual work too, he should try to say the Jesus prayer. Moreover, the proper position of the body also helps the athlete of the Jesus prayer. The fathers recommend that when someone prays for a long time, he should sit on a small stool, shut his eyes or fix them on a certain point, preferably on his chest, where the heart is. St. Gregory Palamas gives the example of the prophet Elijah, who, as the scripture says, quote, went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, and in this way the drought came to an end. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. First Kings chapter 18, verses 42 to 45. Indeed, Father, the prophet opened the heavens praying in this position. We also open the heavens in the same way, and the springs of divine grace comes into our dry hearts. I later read this passage from St. Gregory Palamas, which Yerondas mentioned. The philosopher Barlam sarcastically used to call the Hezekists Omphilosif Soki, the ones who have their soul in their navel. 
And the holy and God-bearing Gregory, explaining their position and their action, answered him, Even Elijah himself, who was the most perfect in the vision of God, propping his head on his knees, and with great effort concentrating his noose on itself and on God, made the drought of several years cease. The holy God-seeing Father also recommends fixing the eyes on one point as a helpful method. Quote, Do not let your eyes wander here and there, but fix them on your chest or on your navel as a point of concentration. And in this position of the body, recall into the heart the power of the noose, which is ever flowing outwards through the faculty of sight. End of quote. Gregory Palamas, the triads. To continue, the location as well, the Yerundus went on, plays a significant part. It should be quiet and assure external peace. The proper time also is necessary. After the daily work, the mind is usually distracted with many things. That is why the fathers recommend that the practice of noetic prayer should be done, especially in the morning, for one or two hours before the sunrise, when the noose is refreshed and is undistracted, and the body has rested. We reap many benefits then. Question. Yerinda, when the noose is distracted, and I have noticed that this happens many times, what method can we use to restrain it? Answer. There are, for many reasons, barren days and hours, which make the work of prayer difficult. The work of the Jesus prayer becomes then quite toilsome and hard. When we insist, though, the grace of God helps us to find the Jesus prayer again and to go on steadily toward our deification by grace. I shall tell you some ways which help us to overcome these barren days and hours. Firstly, we should not lose courage in any way. Then we should pray mainly with the lips at these times. It is perhaps a privilege of those who are strong, those who are full of grace, to be able to keep their noose easily on the words of the prayer and pray undistractedly. We who are weak, sinful, and full of passions must make every effort and even shed blood. We should ask for help from God when, he, when we realize that our noose is constantly being distracted and scattered. Like the Apostle Peter, who, when he saw the strong wind and he began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Matthew 14.30 We also should do the same when the whirlwind of thoughts and despondency arises. And then what happened in the case of the Apostle will happen to us. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. Matthew 14.31 That is, after arduous prayer with the help of God, all these images which come to distract the news will be dissolved, consumed in flames, invisibly by the name of Christ. I repeat, we must not panic in these cases, but we must go on offering resistance. And our resistance must be as strong as the attack of the evil one. Additionally, during prayer we must not accept even good thoughts, because at that time, even good thoughts excite the noose. And being excited, the noose accepts bad thoughts as well. Good thoughts during prayer open the way for the devil to enter triumphantly and interrupt the holy work of prayer. Then we fall into spiritual adultery because the fathers say that when the noose during the Jesus prayer moves away from the remembrance of God and wanders aimlessly, it commits spiritual adultery. It betrays God and denies him. Is there any greater sin than the betrayal and denial of the most sweet Jesus, especially when it is committed for the sake of the envious enemy who hates everything good? If we still cannot keep the noose from its diffusion, our struggle will become all the more laborious. The ship, Father, can sail the sea either with sails when the wind blows or with oars when there's no wind. The same happens with prayer as well. It goes well when the warmth of the grace of Christ is within us. In its absence, though, the labor of rowing is needed, that is, greater struggle is necessary. We should then take refuge in the study of the fathers. We ought to study various patristic books, which will concentrate the noose. If, while studying, we feel compunction, we should stop and say the Jesus prayer. In this way, we come to understand what is said, that we should read books with a deified heart, and not with our dry reason. We should read books which have been written with the heart and can be read joyously by the heart. Reading and the Jesus prayer should go together. We should recite the Psalms of the prophet David or have recourse to psalmody. 
It is good also to have chosen in advance some troparia, which give rise to compunction, refer to the love of God, to our sinfulness, to the second coming of the Lord, to the invocation of divine help. We should read those and not chant them. Or we should say various prayers helping towards compunction, composed by the Holy Fathers, like the one by St. Isaac the Syrian. As I said previously, we must say the Jesus Prayer with the lips in these cases. We should even say it while using the prayer rope. Then, of course, we have a few fruits, but we should never stay without even this small enjoyment. I repeat again that great patience and endurance are needed in these cases. The thoughts that come may prove to be profitable for us. They may be used for our purification. But how do they help in our purification? When the devil sees that we pray and try to fix the noose on the Jesus prayer, he uses everything to distract us. He employs everything, mainly thoughts about the things that bother us more. He hits on the sensitive point that hurts us a lot. In the pleasure-seeking man, he incites thoughts of voluptuousness. In those who love money, thoughts of avarice. In the ambitious, thoughts of ambition. Therefore, from the thoughts that usually come to us during prayer, we are able to realize our weak points, the impurities within us, the existence of passions, and so we turn our attention and our struggle there. Yaranda, excuse me for the interruption. I confess that I have not had much experience on the subject of the Jesus prayer. However, when I try to practice it, my head hurts from tiredness and often my heart as well. What is this? What should be done in these cases? When the Christian begins this kind of prayer, he experiences this headache and pain in his heart as part of his new spiritual struggle. Sometimes he thinks that his head and heart will break. His head aches so much that he feels he will die. This pain is to some extent natural and is brought about because the noose is not used to this activity and because of the specific position of the body. Many times, however, the devil exploits this state to make him stop the Jesus prayer. He must persevere when he feels pain in his head. When he feels pain in the heart, he must determine whether he has embarked prematurely on this work, using methods which were not for him. It is possible, however, that the pain in his heart may help him, because it may motivate him to concentrate his noose on the place where it hurts, and to pray without distraction. You express yourself very concisely, and I would like you to explain more fully. Why is it necessary to persevere when the noose suffers? Because immediately afterwards, purification begins. The tears reveal this. Streams of tears start to flow. The noose is purified and descends into the heart, and the pain, the suffering, stops. The tears cannot be held back or explained, and the person praying made no effort to cry. He stopped. I could see a big tear shining and illuminating his face. Involuntarily, I felt tears in my eyes, too. His voice, his illumined thoughts, broke my stony heart. I recalled St. Arsenios, about whom it is written in the sayings of the fathers. It was said of him that all his life, while he sat at his manual work, he had a piece of cloth on his chest for the tears which fell from his eyes. When Abba Piman learned that he was dead, he said, weeping, Truly you are blessed, Abba Arsenios, for you wept for yourself in this world. He who does not weep for himself here below will weep eternally in the hereafter. It is impossible not to weep, whether voluntary here or whether compelled through suffering there. End of quote. He interrupted me. We should not stop praying immediately we have a pain, he said, as if emerging from an ocean of inexhaustible tears. For the devil, who is extraordinarily cunning, deceitful, and wicked, brings all these thoughts into our mind to destroy us, to kill us. The athlete of prayer knows the wiles of the devil and his designs. 1 Corinthians 2.11 The devil whispers to him, Stop praying, otherwise you will become mad. You will damage your heart. I shall read you an example from the sayings of the fathers. Quote, there was a monk who was seized by cold and fever every time he began to pray, and he suffered from headaches as well. In this condition he said to himself, I am ill and near to death, so now I will get up before I die and pray. By reasoning in this way, 
he did violence to himself and prayed. When he had finished, the fever abated also. So by reasoning in this way, the brother resisted and praying was able to conquer the evil one. That is why the athlete of prayer must re- disregard any sort of pain. Yet and I would like you to tell me more about the pain of the heart. I know that the fathers ascribe great importance to this pain. They consider it to be the best route for the Jesus prayer to take. If you find it advisable, share with me a few thoughts on this subject. It is true what you have just said. The fathers, because they were engaged in the Jesus prayer, rather because they lived it, passed through this stage, and therefore regarded this pain as very important. This pain should come, though only, of course, to those who practice the Jesus prayer unceasingly. They regard it as important because it is through this pain which shows that the noose has descended into the heart and is united with it through the energy of the Holy Spirit, that serenity is imparted to the soul and body, the power of soul's rational faculty is purified, and a clear discernment of thoughts is achieved. Only then can we discern our thoughts well and understand their evolution and their outcome. So a hesychist, without having outwardly committed a sin, knows the state of the sinner perfectly. This is possible because through the science of asceticism he knows the pattern of thoughts from beginning to end. In a similar way, the hesychist, because his heart has become extremely sensitive through the energy of prayer, can know almost immediately when praying for someone what state that person is in. He becomes clairvoyant. Let me, however, put things in the right order. We said before that the purpose of the Jesus prayer is to unite the whole of man, that is, the three faculties of the soul. Attention must be concentrated on the heart. Initially, the heart should feel the action of the Jesus prayer, and then heart and noose should unite. For according to the fathers, first the heart feels the presence of God, the presence of grace, and then incites the mind too. The fathers first lived these things and then spoke of God so as to safeguard this experience and life. Therefore, it is the heart which first feels the warmth and sweetness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In contrast, The absence of grace is manifest in the frigidity and coldness of the heart. I repeat that a person loves God first with his heart and then with his noose. The commandment of God is clear. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Luke 10.27 Perhaps you are aware that reason is not abolished within the church, but after the fall, it became almost incapable of perceiving God. When, however, inner spiritual sensitivity develops, reason, too, is spurred on to understand God. The heart then discerns whether we keep the commandments of God or not. The union, however, of nous and heart can only come about through the energy of the Holy Spirit. We acquire grace with repentance and the keeping of the commandments of Christ. Through the action of the grace, the noose finds the heart, and the two are united. This is an important step for the Jesus prayer and deification. This is why the heart of man must be broken. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Many people employ various methods for the descent of the noose into the heart, but we must emphasize that repentance is the safest way. It is very good, therefore, when crying for our sins, that we feel a pain or sometimes a warmth in our heart, and in general that we understand its movement and its feeling. However, this should take place gradually, for it is possible that this sudden activity in weak and unaccustomed hearts may create a slight aberration, which does not have serious consequences, but may stop the prayer. In the case of this sort of pain, the practice of saying the Jesus prayer aloud is recommended. When, however, the heart is strong, it is recommended that our attention should be sustained there, even if it hurts. This, of course, will be clarified by our discerning and inspired spiritual father. This pain is healthy, natural, and saving. Many ascetics think they have something wrong with their heart and go to visit doctors, but they cannot find anything wrong. This is the pain of grace. It shows that prayer has entered the heart and acts there. This is a significant step. 
Question. I have heard that many saints felt the Jesus prayer to be active in their heart at a certain moment, and they even felt it to be a gift from God through the intercessions of the Theotokos. Is this true? Certainly. Many holy hesychists know very well at which moment the Jesus prayer began to act in their heart. From then on, they continually say it, whatever work they do. The prayer never ceases. Truly, they feel it to be a gift from the Most Holy Mother of God. St. Gregory Palamas, praying before the icon of the Theotokos and saying, Illumine my darkness, received the gift of theology. It must be said that love for the Theotokos is closely connected with love for Christ. We love the Theotokos because we love Christ, or we love her so as to attain to the love of Christ. The fathers are quite expressive on this point. St. Germanos, Patriarch of Constantinople, says, if you, Theotokos, did not lead the way, no one could become spiritual. No one could be saved except through you, Theotokos. And St. Gregory Palamas says, She alone is the frontier between created and uncreated nature, and no one can come to God except through her and through the mediator who was born of her. And none of the God's gifts can be given either to angels or to men except through her. We receive many gifts through the Theotokos. Since she gave us the greatest gift, Christ, will she not also give us the rest? So, when we pray, we should say, O Holy Theotokos, save us, and not simply intercede for us. Let me go back to a question that came to me while you were talking about the union of the noose with the heart. When the noose descends into the heart, does it remain there continually? And if so, how can a person work? How can he be performed his assigned duty in the monastery? First of all, the noose is not assimilated or destroyed, but becomes complete and reaches its natural state. It is contrary to its nature when it remains outside its essence, the heart. With the Jesus prayer, it rejects all elements alien to its nature. Afterwards, when the noose descends into the heart, a small part remains outside. This small remnant can be busy with other things without the noose being separated from the heart. For example, during the divine liturgy, a hesychist priest can be attentive to a part of the ritual or tell a deacon or another priest something relevant to the performance of the mystery without his noose being separated from his heart. However, when this remnant of the noose strays away toward inappropriate things, it can completely cut off the noose from its essence. That is why one ascetic, while saying the Jesus prayer, kept count of the prayer ropes he'd prayed so that he could keep his thoughts busy and stop it doing him harm. You will no doubt have understood that the devil fights against us violently by means of that remnant.